Good evening and welcome to the Jurassic Arc uh, series. My name is Andreas Vasmud. I'm the chairman of program at the BLSI and I'm delighted to have Ben Moon with us today to give a talk about ichthyosaurs and 3D modeling. Uh, but before we get into that, as you can see, uh, uh, it is a very select audience tonight. Uh, but please still uh, keep your uh, camera off and remain on mute until we get to the Q&A session. By way of introduction for Ben, uh, I'm very privileged that he's actually found the time to, to talk to us today. Uh, ben is a paleontologist specializing in the evolution of marine vertebrates in the Mesozoic period, with a particular interest in ichthyosaurs. Uh, Ben's doctoral thesis was entitled Ichthyosaurs of the British Middle and Upper Jurassic and the Evolution of Ichthyosaurs, in which he elucidated several interesting trends in the evolution of the group and upon which his academic work is continuing to build. Though ichthyosaurs were a diverse group of animals with a broad representation in the fossil record, a decade ago, one could count the number of paleontologists specializing in ichthyosaurs on one hand. More recently, however, a new generation of scientists have taken the group in hand and are shining a new light on their paleobiology and evolutionary history. And Dr. Moon is at the forefront in these investigations. Now a senior research associate at the University of Bristol's Paleobiology Research Group, Dr. Moon's work has included the extensive X-ray microcomputed tomography scanning of many key specimens from the BLSI's very own Strohbank Legerstätte collection, resulting in a data set that is liable, is, is liable to yield interesting research for many years to come. Over to you, Ben. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And um, yes, um, it certainly builds me up for a, a good talk today, I hope. Um, so yes, I will um, I'll share my screen now. Uh, that one should be good. And hopefully you can see that. Um, yes, so um, uh, yes, so I'll be talking about um, my work on using uh, building digital ichthyosaurs um, using CT scanning and various computational techniques and how we can not only use them to um, start looking at the anatomy of these different um, and very interesting ancient marine animals, but also how they were starting to work beyond that, how they were functioning and how they were playing their own part within these ancient ecosystems. And of course, with any good story that uh, about ichthyosaurs, we have to start with the um, with the Jurassic in Lyme Regis. So here on the left is a snapshot of Lyme Regis, um, as you see it in the present day with these wonderful um, various clay and limey cliffs. And it was in the early 1800s that Mary Anning became famous, quite rightly so, for finding some of the first ichthyosaurs and collecting these marvellous animals amongst many other marine animals and terrestrial animals that were found at the time. And this was that very first recognized ichthyosaur specimen. It's now called Temnodontosaurus, and it's housed in the uh, Natural History Museum in their famous marine reptile gallery, where you can go and see a huge number of specimens um, in a wonderful sort of old, Victor old Victorian style um, uh, gallery uh, on the wall there with quite a few important specimens, both from these very early ones and much more recent ones. And this is an important specimen because it's one of those first ancient creatures that was uh, found and recognized and thought to be completely different from anything else. The first people who studied these, they didn't know what it was. They said maybe it was a crocodile, maybe it was some sort of lizard, maybe it was related to whales, and they had lots of other different ideas about where this organism came from. But it didn't take long before many other specimens were found as well. And lots of them were, uh, like the first one, exquisitely preserved, not just with the, the skull or part of the body, but preserving the whole of the animal there in almost life position. And in many cases, like you can see with this one, with the, um, with the young uh, intact and in and around the body. 
So this is real spectacular preservation. And it's um, things like this which lead to various ichthyosaur sort of deposits being known as Lagerstätten. This is a German word which refers to the storage and preservation of these animals. And over the, the course of the, the 1800s and then through into the early 1900s, indeed right up to the present day, there have been a huge diversity of ichthyosaurs found, originally from the Jurassic being one of the most popular and most well sampled um, geological periods. We found a diversity of various ones such as ichthyosaurus, this famous one from Lyme Regis, through to the much bigger Temnodontosaurus that Mariani first found, one of the mega carnivores around this time, to weird ones like Urinosaurus and Excalibursaurus, which both um, look very, very similar to um, swordfish with a, a very elongate snout, very thin elongate snout. And I've been privileged over the last 10 years or so to be able to work on many of these different um, ichthyosaurs, looking at their diversity and um, how they evolve through time. And it's um, ichthyosaurs and this diversity, which has captured the public imagination virtually right from the get-go. This is a famous um, watercolour by Henry de la Beach from 1830, um, showing the diversity and the first reconstruction of an ancient time. This is a reconstruction of what Lyme Regis was like about 200 million years ago, when all of these critters, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, various um, pterosaurs flying in, the, uh, flying in the sky, ammonites as well, swimming in the ocean, and lots of fish and uh, even dinosaurs, although they weren't discovered by this time on the land. Um, and so this uh, marks um, some of the first times at which paleontology began to really capture the public's imagination. Lots of people went fossil hunting down in Lion Regis and across the, the rest of Europe particularly. And this, is, uh, this fascination has continued right up to the present day. This is a much more recent reconstruction of a slightly later time. Here we're looking at the uh, about 160 million years ago in the later part of the Jurassic. But still, this is the UK represented by a series of different ichthyosaurs, such as Ophthalmosaurus, plesiosaurs as well, like Cryptoclidus, and a giant fish, in this case, looking at um, something similar to Leeds ichthys. Lots of these fossils were found around Cambridge um, and Peterborough area, uh, again, over the last 150 years or so. And so what are ichthyosaurs? Well, ichthyosaurs are a group of marine reptiles. And by the term reptile, I mean lots of different things. So um, on one side, you've got a crocodile line lineage that includes um, crocodiles and eventually evolving into dinosaurs and things like that. But on the other side, you've got uh, the lizard-like line. Um, and this lizard line is likely where all of these or many of these marine reptiles um, evolved and were related to things such as the four flippered um, Loch Ness monster like plesiosaurs, but also the very fish or dolphin like um, ichthyosaurs you can see at the top. And these are some of the most completely adapted animals to marine life. They're particularly well known from the Jurassic of UK and Europe, but they do have a, a global distribution. Um, first appearing about 250 million years ago and then becoming extinct around about 90 million years. So it's 160 million years of evolution. And across that 160 million years, they had um, a huge diversity. Over 115 different species of ichthyosaur are count, currently known and recognised and more are named um, every year. There have been several in the past a uh, year or two alone from people finding new specimens or re-examining specimens that have previously been lumped into other species. And not just that diversity of species, but also a huge diversity of form from relatively small, quite elongate lizard-like forms early on in the Triassic when they first moved into the water, through to giant 20 meter long Shastasaurus, for instance, in the uh, early late Triassic, and then the more familiar, the, the tuna dolphin-like forms, such as Ichthyosaurus, Temnodontosaurus, that we find throughout the rest of the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. And it's this, um, the Jurassic rocks, the Jurassic period that I'm going to primarily focus on um, in my, uh, my talk tonight. So the Jurassic started about 200 million years ago and went right way through until about 145 million years ago. And it covers a lot of the most famous, um, famous uh, marine reptiles, ichthyosaurs, plesiosaurs, and even towards dinosaurs and pterosaurs. 
Um, this is the point at which uh, Brachiosaurus and the giant dinosaurs were evolved, and also when some of the first birds, such as Archaeopteryx and Anchionis, were around throughout the Jurassic. And the UK has a huge swathe of Jurassic rocks going right through the middle of England, all the way from the Dorset coast, where we see Lyme Regis and the Jurassic Coast World Heritage Site, right the way up in the north and um, northeasterly direction, across towards Cambridgeshire and up towards Yorkshire. And there's also a few other, other bits um, up around the Isle of Skye as well. And these Jurassic rocks have been studied, people have collected from them for a huge amount of time. And so there's lots of specimens in museums across the country, um, both the National Museums, the Natural History Museum in London, but also more provincial museums and smaller ones. So Dorset Museum has a lot, Bristol Museum, going up towards Whitby Museum and the like in Yorkshire as well. And as I said, Jurassic, Jurassic ichthyosaurs are perhaps some of the most famous. They were certainly the first found, and they're preserved exceptionally well and virtually complete in so many ways. Um, but often they are preserved in this highly flattened state where the ichthyosaur has landed after dying, landed on the seafloor, rock has covered it, and over time this has been squished lots and compressed, and so the ichthyosaur ends up being a very flattened specimen. This is not just found in the UK um, at this time, but also in other places like um, these, um, these fossils from the Posidonia shell in Germany. And while these there are loads of specimens there, many of them are flattened like this, uh, and and preserved from one side, sort of giving you a partial view of these ichthyosaurs. But the Positonia shell is from the same time period as the Strawberry Bank, which I'm going to talk about now. And this is a locality which is just outside of Ilminster, so in um, deepest, darkest Somerset, I guess you would say, not too far from Taunton in the southwest of England. And first being able to see these specimens that were collected in the middle of the 1850s and then held in the originally Bath uh, Museum, Bath Geological Museum, and uh, now the uh, BRLSI. These are really exquisite specimens and unusual in many ways, not just because they're actually fully three-dimensional. So rather than being a flat slab with lots of bones in it, you can turn them around and look at them from different angles, but also because they are conveniently um, they were uh, preserved in nodules and they broke apart. So they are conveniently also hand-sized, meaning you're not dealing with massive slabs of very heavy rock, but you can actually physically pick these up, look at them from different angles. And over the past um, 10 years or so, um, this material has been recurated at the, um, the BRLSI and uh, prepared through um, various grants from, for instance, the Esme Fairburn um, Fund. And so these are now exquisitely preserved, prepared, and in their full glory for everything, everyone to see. But even better than that, it's not just an individual specimen. There's a whole collection of different marine reptiles. We think there's two different species of ichthyosaur represented there. There's at least one species of marine crocodile from the time, and then several other specimens of uh, fish, as well as a whole multitude of insects, um, squid, and things like that. And various other um, invertebrates also in this in this single locality that was found just outside of Ilminster. And as far as the vertebrate group, the vertebrates go, all of them are completely articulated, they're all fully three-dimensional and make perfect candidates for starting to get an idea of how these animals lived and work, not just as flattened things, which you have to imagine, but as fully three-dimensional living organisms. And this is one of the opportunities and things that I've been working on, that um, x-rays particularly make um, a, a good point at which to bring in and start to study these things. And you may be familiar with x-rays um, in a medical sense. Um, these are the same x-rays that are used when a doctor wants to see whether you've got a broken bone or in a mammogram or even at things like um, airport security when they're starting to look through your bags and things. But if you crank up the power a little bit, they can, the x-rays can not just pass through the flesh uh, or your, your uh, thin sides of a bag, but they can start to pass through whole chunks of rock and not just, uh, let's see, not just the bones that are on the outside, but also start to see the things that are on the inside. 
X-rays were originally discovered by um, Wilhelm Röntgen in uh, 1895. Um, and this famous image on the left was one of the first X-ray images showing the, the bones from his wife's hand with, their, with a ring on them. Um, and Röntgen actually won the first Nobel Prize in physics for this discovery of X-rays. And it wasn't long before they were used not just for medical purposes, but also for trying to see through many other things as well. Particularly famously, um, they've been used for a long time uh, looking at these uh, exquisitely preserved invertebrates from the 400 million year old Hunsruck slate from, uh, from Western Germany. Um, and these are slabs where you can't see anything on the slab, but if you, uh, or you can see very little, but as soon as you put them into the x-rays, the minerals that these organisms are preserved in are uh, deflected by the x-rays and you can start to see all of the internal structure which otherwise isn't visible, including a very rare preservation, for instance, of the, the legs of trilobites, which you don't really get, uh, certainly don't get often anywhere else. But beyond just using x-rays, most of these ones you'll be familiar with are taking an x-ray, shining it through the body and then taking a single photographic image, which again is just a flattened, uh, a flattened and two-dimensional version, often looking through a whole body. One of the things that we've got um, recently at the University of Bristol is our own new um, CT scanner. So CT stands for computed tomography. And this is using X-rays to build um, a, up a 3D image. Here you can see Tom and Liz happily standing around or sitting in our CT scanner as we get, get ready to scan some exciting specimens. And the idea behind this is that you have a, an emitter that fires out some X-rays. These go from here on the left of the diagram, they pass through the specimen and are then picked up by a detector on the right, which sends the images to a computer. But the important thing is that rather than taking just a single static image, if you rotate the specimen slowly and take lots of images at very slightly different angles, the computer can then look at how these images are changing uh, through a full 360 degree rotation and then work out where all of the different bits of the stuff that are inside, how they relate to each other. And so this allows the computer to then create a full three dimensional image of the outside surface, but also of the, the bones, the structures, the individual rocks within the specimen as a whole. And so using this technology, we've been able to go from looking at the, the exquisitely prepared but still external surface of the strawberry bank ichthyosaurs, you can see this one here, to building a fully three-dimensional model of these ichthyosaurs that you can look at, you can rotate and you can see, but also you can then decide to cut right through the middle. And because you're working with digital things here, you can do that quite happily. Before computers, you would have to physically saw through the specimen and not many curators like you doing that. But with a CT scan, we can just quite easily snip right through the middle and start to see what we get within the specimen, within the rocket itself. And so this might be a little bit difficult to see. And I've picked out a few instances here surrounded in the, the purple circles. And what we're looking for are these slightly darker patches. These represent the individual bones within the specimen held within what's a, a limestone rock surrounding it. And it's these slices, what we call slices of CT scans going sequentially through the whole specimen that we use to start building them up. So you might be able to, if I up the contrast, you can start to see them a little bit better. And so once we hear these, this top circle is looking at parts of the, around the back of the skull and the brain case. And at the bottom, on the bottom left one, that's part of the jaw that we can see there. And so by going through the whole specimen in a slice by slice basis, we can then start to do essentially what is really fancy colouring in, picking out the individual bones, starting to separate them out and identify them. And so then going from our original specimen, which we can see with the eye, through this 3D image of the, um, of the ichthyosaur slicing it, we can then start to identify the individual bones within there and start to see how they were organised um, all of the bits that we can't necessarily see externally. And so we've been able to do this with uh, a couple of ichthyosaurs and also the crocodile from Strawberry Bank. So this was done, uh, this particular ichthyosaur was done with a, a master's student a few years ago, Ryan Merrick. And we were able to identify all of this internal anatomy, seeing the specimen from the outside, 
using the CT scan to replicate that, but also turning it around and looking at the specimen from top bottom and all of the bones within there. But not just looking at the anatomy, it also allows us to look at other things and work out other things about how, uh, how the soft tissues were arranged within the skull of these ichthyosaurs especially, and also how it starts to feed into what the animal was doing, how it was living um, and things like that. And so ichthyosaurs are particularly famous for having an extraordinarily large eye. You can see it in a few of these examples here. Um, and this image, uh, the reconstruction of Ophthalmosaurus at the bottom, is famous because it has the, the largest known eye of any, any organism that's ever lived. I think the largest recorded eye is about 26 centimetres in diameter. So if you imagine a football, that's approximately the size of this eye. And researchers have looked at this and quite rightly think that this is a large eye. These are clearly highly visual predators. And they come up with a couple of ideas, whether this is using it to catch lots of light so they can dive deeply in very murky, dark waters, or being able to have a big eye allows lots of individual cells, which means you can pick out very small specks of prey at great distance um, and be able to hunt. And the two of them sort of play together. But that's, um, as far as sensory biology, that's sort of the limits of it. Um, but fortunately with, um, oh, and so um, Ophthalmosaurus was famously included in BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs series, um, broadcast in 1999, um, showing, showing this massive eye and their ability to hunt through dark waters. But these specimens that we've been able to, um, at Strawberry Bank, that we've been able to CT scan are starting to show us a bit more about and allow us to infer a bit more about how these how these animals were sensing and living. And so this was part of um, Ryan Marrick's master's work as well. We were able to use this skull of an ichthyosaur called Halphiateryx um, found in Strawberry Bank and then start to look at the anatomy within there. So we weren't just looking at the bones which are shown in this image in grey, but we were also then able to start to look within the bones, the spaces within them. And these are the spaces that are filled by the soft tissues that aren't normally preserved um, in fossils. And so they weren't preserved in this case, but by looking and comparing with modern animals, we can then say, here are the, where the bones are. If we start to fill in the gaps between the bones, then we can find out what the shape, what the size of the different organ, organs within the skull, within the cranium are. And in this case, we were particularly in, uh, interested in reconstructing the brain of this ichthyosaur halphiateryx. And here it is. This is the first time in three dimensions that an ichthyosaur brain had been reconstructed based on CT scans. Um, I say the in three dimensions because there was um, an earlier instance by Chris McGowan as part of his thesis in 1969 using, um, using a, uh, an acid prepared ichthyosaurus and latex casting to be able to um, show the surface of the brain at the top. But this was the first time that we were able to not just have the top surface, but also look at the side. And so here we are looking in a side on view from the right side. The front is to the right of this. And this is what at least most of an ichthyosaur brain did look like from 183 uh, million years ago. And there were some surprises, but there are also some things that we um, we were quite expecting to find. In particular, we found that the optic lobe, this uh, part in the middle of the image in blue, was one of the largest and certainly very large compared to other, um, other lizards, other crocodiles, other things from that time and from modern organisms, uh, modern times. And this, this is um, not unexpected because um, as I said, they've got large, ichthyosaurs have large eyes. You would expect them to have a big optic lobe to um, take in all of that information and, and do stuff with it. We were perhaps a little surprised to find that the olfactory bulb on the right in purple was also very large as well, um, which had been mentioned, well, not in terms of senses, but a few interesting things to do with those had been mentioned in ichthyosaurs, but not very extensively. And so having such a large olfactory bulb suggests that smell or some sort of chemosensory, um, chemosensory sense was um, quite important within ichthyosaurs um, to find, help them find prey in waters where otherwise they might not be able to see it. 
And indeed, going back to the back of the brain as well, the size of the cerebellum was also was comparatively large. And this seems to suggest not only was it being able to take in the sensory things from the optic lobe as seeing from the olfactory bulb and smelling, but with the cerebellum being the thinking part, that means it was able to use those things and start thinking about what it can do with them. And there's a certain amount of thought, uh, particularly my hypothesis is that being, uh, being a, a marine organism means that not only do you have to think about, I need to go forward, backward, right or left to find food, but also I need to think about going up, I need to go to the surface to breathe, or maybe I need to dive deep and I find that. And so it's being able to move in completely in three dimensions as potentially a little bit of extra cognitive load. That means you need a little bit more brain power to help you help ensure you can use these, this information from your eye, from your smell, to be able to find prey uh, and um, to work with that information. And so this was really interesting because it means that these ichthyosaurs, which had been studied and quite a lot of people knew about their general morphology, but this was one of the, the few and one of the first instances of being able to start to talk about the biology of these ichthyosaurs, not just what they looked like, but also how they were using that uh, to live and how they were doing things differently. But um, the senses are not just the only, um, the only important thing as far as um, uh, being a living, breathing organism. Um, it's, and it's quite a lot of paleontologists over the past 20 years or so have been able to start looking at how different organisms feed. Feeding is one of the, the critical actions, both of the skull, but of the animal as a whole. If you can't feed, then you're not going to survive very long. And uh, for better or worse, the um, headline grabbing ones are often about dinosaurs, particularly T-Rex having either the deadliest bite or the strongest bite, or on some occasions, maybe not being at least pound for pound quite so good as a, a finch, for instance. And so it sort of goes back and forth as whether T-Rex was really the, the biggest biter of all time, or whether it was just something who had a, had a big mouth and couldn't really do much with it. And so this hadn't really been done um, to ichthyosaurs too much. Um, again, Chris McGowan being very much a pioneer of his time in his thesis had looked at his specimen of ichthyosaurus and started doing some, some calculations based on um, estimates of where the muscles attached and using um, relatively simple lever arm mechanics. Um, but having these 3D, 3D um, CT scans means that like with the brain, we can start to fill in the gaps where the soft tissues were lying. And so rather than filling right in the middle of the cranium in the, in the skull where the brain was, we can start to look at the um, sort of the areas on the side where the muscles were attaching. And so the muscles attach in this ichthyosaur on the sides of the skull just behind the eye. You can sort of feel it similar if you, at the top of your cheek, if you move your jaw, you can start to feel the muscles pulling around there as they close your jaw, or then muscles down below as they open your jaw. Um, and so the main bite force comes from muscles going from the side and the back of the jaw right up attach there at the bottom and attach at the top around your temple and on the top of the skull. And in ichthyosaurs, it's the same sort of case. The, the muscles go and attach from the back of the jaw, um, uh, which you can see in bottom on the pink, go behind where the eye is and then attach at the top of the skull, which you can see in the sort of teal colour in the, uh, the scan on the left. And so the image on the left shows a side view. The image at the right shows a, a top view. And so this is quite an important part for trying to work out where all these muscles attach. And this work, um, I will admit, is somewhat, um, it's still ongoing both for me and uh, use, uh, with a master's um, student uh, who's doing it as a project. So Sarah Jamison Todd, um, who is looking at this and um, reconstructing the muscles more completely than I have done. But we can, using the skull, and I've peeled away some of the bones in the rock, we can look at using the CT scans using the specimen itself and looking at, start to reconstruct where the muscles were attaching at the top and the bottom, and also then using the bones around and trying to work out how much musculature there was. And one of the interesting things about ichthyosaurs is that um, when it comes to the jaw, all of the muscles attach right at the back. 
So the, the place that the jaw joint, um, the jaw articulates between the, the jaw itself, the lower jaw and the upper jaw is right at the back. And the muscles are in this, uh, in this specimen, no more than a couple of centimeters in front of that. And then uh, as you go further forward, that's where you get the rest of the jaw and all, the, all of the teeth. And so in this case, it acts like a, um, a third class uh, lever. So sort of similarly in the case of a, a hammer where you've got your hand is doing the, the moving and the rotating, and then you're getting all of the force at the end, or you're getting all of the motion at the end. So in this case, the muscles and the jaw joint are acting like your hand uh, as, the, as the fulcrum, and then the, the end of the hammer is where the, the teeth are, where the bite forces are applied. But having all of, the, all of the muscles really close to the jaw joint means that you don't actually get that much force at the end of the hammer, but you do get a lot of speed. Uh, and so in the case of the jaws, that means that the jaws weren't really clamping down with a big bite force, but instead um, they were able to close really quickly. And it's likely that this was very useful because a lot of the diet of ichthyosaurs were slippery or very fast moving prey, such as small fish or um, squid and things like that. And so you, they're not big things. You don't necessarily need to clamp down and chomp them fully, but it's very useful to be able to close your jaw quickly so that the fish can't escape or swim away before you've managed to catch and eat them. And we've done this in the case of this ichthyosaur, which is Stenoterygius, again from Strawberry Bank. Um, but this is a relatively small ichthyosaur. The skull of this ichthyosaur is 30 centimetres or thereabouts. In this case, it's a, also a juvenile specimen, but the adults didn't really get much more than 50 centimetres or 60 centimetres. A slightly bigger beast was this macropredatory ichthyosaur, Temnodontosaurus, which I mentioned right at the beginning. And this is famous for being one of the, the biggest marine reptiles of the Jurassic, living around the same time as the strawberry bank, um, the strawberry bank ichthyosaurs. And you find specimens of this in both the UK as well as also in um, Germany. This specimen you see at the top left is also um, a Bath Geological Museum specimen. It's currently housed in the um, National Museum of Wales over in Cardiff, like quite a few of the the larger specimens from, from the Bath Museum. But this whole skull of an ichthyosaur is almost two meters long. So it's a much bigger, um, much bigger ichthyosaur than Stenoterygius that I've just shown you previously. But not just is it a, a longer skull, it's also a much more heavily built skull. The teeth are bigger and it's clearly built much more for eating big prey. So these are either really big fish or the other smaller ichthyosaurs, smaller plesiosaurs and marine crocodiles that were around at the time. And so we're able to work on this and look at this ichthyosaur, take a, rather than taking a, a CT scan, so not using x-rays and showing the internal anatomy, I was able to create a, a 3D surface scan using lots of photos taken from different angles to be able to work on the 3D um, 3D shape of the ichthyosaur and also reconstruct the available space for muscles both in, in the back of the jaw. And in this case, both being a bigger ichthyosaur and a more predatory ichthyosaur, there was lots more space for muscles. There was lots more muscles packed in and the jaws were also built for handling more fossils. So rather than uh, more force, so rather than being, I think, around about um, 50 to 100 Newton's bite force like Stenoterygius I just shown you could bite with, we found that this Temnodontosaurus was able to bite with potentially 30,000 newtons of force. And so this is essentially the same force as what would happen if a Jeep, a four by four Jeep was pressed onto your head. And it's a huge amount of bite force that would almost certainly be able to catch and uh, dismember any, anything that this animal could get its, get its um, teeth into. And so this is just another bit of evidence showing this is really the, the macro predatory. This is the top of the food of this um, top of the food chain in this ancient Jurassic ecosystem from from Lyme Regis and the like. But beyond just looking at skulls as well, and indeed beyond just looking at CT scans, we can also start to look at other aspects of ichthyosaur biology by taking in the whole body. And so there are many um, ichthyosaurs that are preserved in 
nearly complete and almost fully articulated specimens. This is a five meter long Temdenontosaurus from um, southwestern Germany, again from the same age as Strawberry Bank. And by using these ichthyosaurs, many paleo artists and scientists have grouped together and started coming up with these highly accurate um, reconstructions of ichthyosaurs. So here's one done by Sergei Krasovsky, showing, showing a reconstruction of this ichthyosaur as a tuna-like organism. We can do this based on the skeletons and also a few instances where soft tissues have been preserved, showing us the shape of the paddles, the shape of the tail fin and things like that. But beyond just having um, these flattened two-dimensional image reconstructions, we can also then start to look at reconstructing the full three-dimensional shape of these ichthyosaurs as well, such as in this case, using a 3D model of this Temnodontosaurus. And this is research we've done in collaboration with a former PhD student of mine, Susanna Gutara, where we've been looking at reconstructing these ichthyosaurs fully three-dimensionally, not just for one ichthyosaur, Temnodontosaurus, but for a whole series of them covering a full 100 million years of ichthyosaur evolution, right from the very earliest ones, which were very elongate lizard-like ichthyosaurs, through to the, the much more highly um, ocean, uh, ocean cruising adapted ones that did have a very tuna-like body plan with a crescent-like tail fin and paddle-like limbs as other features. And we were able to use um, an engineering technique, which is called computational fluid dynamics, to essentially simulate how the water flows around these different three-dimensional ichthyosaur models. It's um, sort of a, a, a somewhat easier and certainly somewhat cheaper way of essentially building a, a flume tank and building models, or indeed a much cheaper and easier way of building a time machine and going back to the Jurassic and trying to find these ichthyosaurs swimming. But using this technique, we were able to look at how, how the water flows around these different ichthyosaur body shapes and how the change in shape from a, an elongate lizard-like early ichthyosaur to the more tuna-like later ichthyosaurs might have affected the ability of these ichthyosaurs to move through water. And this, we did this using a metric which is known, of, known as the cost of transport. And so this takes in factors like how much effort, it's essentially a a metric of how much effort does an ichthyosaur need to put in to swimming forward to get where it's going. The higher the cost of transport, the more effort you need to put into swimming forward. Um, so I guess a, a sort of way to think about this is that a, if you put a, a cube into your bath and try and push it around, then that's going to have a higher cost of transport. It's going to be more difficult to move than having a, a more streamlined, uh, more streamlined shape, for instance. What we were able to find, and uh, forgive me for using a couple of graphs, but I think this is often the easiest way to show this, is that um, what we found is that, and so surprisingly, is that when you sort of normalized and kept all the ichthyosaurs at the same size, so this is just trying to show the difference because of their shapes, there was really no change throughout this 100 million year period of ichthyosaur evolution. Um, this graph you, you can see on the left is showing the cost of transport as the height of the bar. And compared to a level one, which is a modern dolphin, so all the values, they're slightly higher, but about the same as a modern dolphin. So they have to put in the same amount of effort to go forward as a dolphin, but they're all about the same. So this change in shape from the lizard-like form to the tuna-like form didn't really have much of an impact into ichthyosaurs moving forward just on their own. But what we were surprised to see is that by incorporating the swimming style, of these ichthyosaurs, which range from the uh, a very eel-like form in the earlier ones, where they used the whole of their body in a, si in a sinuous motion to go forward, to a more tuna-like swimming style, where it's really just the tail that's flapping, um, that um, this had quite a strong effect on the, the amount of effort these ichthyosaurs need to swim, seeing on this graph here. And so those higher bars to the left of that graph show that the, these ichthyosaurs that are using a, a less efficient eel-like swimming uh, method actually have to put in more effort into moving forward than the later ones which are using a more tuna-like swimming method. But this is just comparing ichthyosaurs at the same size, and of course not all ichthyosaurs were the same size, 
And there was a huge range of variation, right? The way from half a meter long ichthyosaurs very early on in their evolution through to 20 plus meter ichthyosaurs um, at about halfway through or a third of the way through. And then in the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, where there's a range going from about two meters all the way up to eight meters or more. And it's once we incorporate size that we actually see the biggest changes. So this, this graph is showing both size and different swimming, but you can see that moving from the smallest ichthyosaurs early on to the largest ichthyosaurs later, there's a huge decrease in the amount of effort these ichthyosaurs need to swim. And it's this, this size and this increase in body size for evolution that is actually quite important. And we were for the first time able to show that this is an important trend in ichthyosaur evolution. And we've been starting to show it in other groups as well, that by increasing the size of, by increasing your size, that means you can effectively reduce the amount of effort for your body size that you're having to put into swimming forward. And so that means you become a much more efficient swimmer, a much more efficient cruiser through the Mesozoic oceans. and means that you can put more effort into finding food, finding a mate and just generally surviving rather than simply having to get between places. And there's other, other instances or other aspects of ichthyosaur biology as well that we're looking to study as well as comparing it to other marine reptiles, such as the long-necked and four-flippered plesiosaurs, and how do different aspects of these biology affect their, affect their swimming and affect the, their efficiency of moving through water. And so I hope that I've shown you um, in these few instances that 3D uh, reconstruction is the current forefront of paleontology. There are lots of people doing this for both ichthyosaurs, as I've shown you here, but also for many other groups of vertebrates, fishes, invertebrate groups, and bringing to life these organisms, which previously had often been thought of as simply flattened on a piece of rock and not really able to do much with. But also I've hopefully shown you that the strawberry bank itself is still providing a, a lot of insight into Jurassic ecosystems, even 150, after, 150 years after the discovery of strawberry bank, 200 years after the discovery of ichthyosaurs, and throughout that time, uh, a whole lot of um, analysis and research onto all of the different organisms and how they fit into these ancient ecosystems. And I'd like to finish by thanking all of the people who I've worked with and who's given me money along the way. And thank you very much for listening today. Thank you very much indeed, Ben. That was a really interesting talk. And uh, uh, given that we are a very select audience mm -hmm. uh, tonight, Jude, thank you for uh, unmuting and, and joining the fray. Uh, <laughs> clearly, you know, we've got plenty of time, I'm sure. I think uh, Henry said he was going to join later, so we'll see whether he does. But do, do you have any questions for Ben? Yeah, I certainly do. First of all, thank you, Ben, for just um, doing that talk as if you could have been talking to 300 people. <laughs> but I knew it was just for me, so that felt very special. And thank you so much. And it was really fascinating. Um, and I suppose what I'm particularly interested in is this extraordinary feature of the eye. And... Um, there seems to be a contradiction because the strawberry bank ichthyosaurs were found on the shore of a shallow sea. Mm. But the, the uh, unique capabilities of that particular eye seem to suggest that they might have been deep water hunters where the light was reduced. Yeah. Um, so I wondered if you could just untangle that a bit, please. Uh, yes, I will. Stop sharing that, but I'll come back to it if I need to. Um, yes, so the Strawberry Bank um, locality is actually um, it's an interesting one. Um, yeah, so as you say, it's um, very close to the the shores of um, the shores of this ancient Jurassic continent. I know some people have reconstructed as being a potentially lagoonal setting, so fairly restricted. The interesting thing about the um, marine reptiles we find there, both the ichthyosaurs and the marine crocodiles we found there, is that they're all either infants or juveniles. So they're not, um, not yet fully grown adults. And in the case, well, in, in many cases of different um, organisms, vertebrates particularly, the juveniles tend to have um, 
comparatively enlarged eyes. And this is um, because uh, the eyes tend to develop early, they develop very quickly and near to full size. I think there's, even if you look at humans, there's very little growth in eye size between a baby and an adult. Um, because, because sight is often important, you don't necessarily want to ruin it by having to grow and change the shape and things like that. So one of the features about the strawberry bank ichthyosaurs, well, because they are young, is that they have exceptionally large eyes. So compared to the adults of the species, the eyes are much larger relative to the skull than they would be. But even when you do look at the adults, the, the eyes do take up much of the side of the skull and they are incredibly noticeable. So both in um, taxa like Halphiotorix and Stenotorygius. Um, and it seems to be because we only find the juveniles in Strawberry Bank, and when we find the adults, we find them in places like southwest Germany or the Yorkshire coast, which are deeper water settings. They have um, very muddy clays, which we associate with much deeper water. Um, that led to the interpretation that Strawberry Bank being this restricted potential lagoon setting was a, a nursery, perhaps for these infant juvenile ichthyosaurs. So the adults would um, give birth, um, in the case of ichthyosaurs, they give birth to live young. They don't lay eggs. Um, so the, the adults would presumably come close to the shore, give birth to their live babies, who would then stay in these shallow, um, shallow waters for some amount of time. Uh, I, we don't know yet whether that's going to be months or years. But then once they've grown up, once they're happy, the food becomes a bit short, then the ichthyosaurs, the crocodiles, would swim out to find their adult hunting grounds in these deeper waters and be able to use their large eyes for these deep water hunting where it is darker um, and settings like that. Um, I guess, yeah, there's sort of, well, we've got a good record here in Europe because there's, um, we go right the way from the shallow water like at Strawberry Bank through to the deep water settings of Germany and um, Yorkshire uh, and even further afield um, in some places. Um, there, it becomes a little bit more difficult as you go towards south, southern Europe, because in the Jurassic period, um, this was well, this area was much wider, so the Medita Mediterranean didn't exist, and Europe, as we know it, uh, today, was actually a long way separate from Africa, separated by the the Tethys Ocean, and over the past two hundred million years or so, Africa has steadily been moving northwards, squeezing the Tethys Ocean smaller and smaller. And eventually this ocean, ancient ocean, was either subducted underneath Europe or lots of it had been squished on top of Europe and formed what we now know as the Alps today. So that's why if you go to the Alps, you're actually looking at ancient Jurassic and Cretaceous sea floors. And it's actually quite cool. In a few places, you can sort of see whole ancient reef systems covering an entire mountainside, which is why um, one of the reasons why doing field work in the Alps is usually done by binoculars rather than with a geological hammer because you you, hold, you look at the scale of mountain size. But yeah, in terms of sort of these localities, nucleosaurs it becomes difficult because a lot of the rocks have become smushed and folded together into the Alps. And so it's more difficult to sort of trace what the ancient oceans, the ancient land masses were as you go further south um, into what was the ancient Tethys Ocean. Right. No, interesting. Uh, just to uh, back up uh, Jude's question is, it seems as if a lot of the brain function seems to do with visual acuity. Uh, and obviously the eye itself seems to suggest it's taking up a, a huge part of, of, of the brain. Um, is, is the ichthyosaur unique in that compared to other sort of marine reptiles? Or is it actually just one of many with that kind of capability? In terms of marine reptiles, ichthyosaurs are the notable ones in having that large an eye. Certainly when you compare it to the marine crocodiles we find at Strawberry Bank, um, they don't have anywhere near as large an eye. Um, and even when you compare it to the other marine reptiles, so plesiosaurs that are around in the Jurassic, or even early in the Triassic where you get several other different marine reptile groups, um, other than those, mm. ichthyosaurs all the way through have much larger eyes than the rest of them. And so in a few cases, so plesiosaurs and things, uh, their relatives, excuse me, um, 
there have been a few well-preserved skulls that have been CT scanned and a few researchers have been able to reconstruct the brains of these um, different things and come up with ideas that vision was used, but perhaps not as important as, for instance, smell. And so these, um, these um, ancient sort origins, as they're called, um, had a, a relatively less or relatively less use for the eye. But this is at least partially related to the fact uh, to the, the sort of inference that they were not going to be such open ocean, such deep water predators. Yeah. And so having these massive eyes to both collect eye, collect light and see it, see it with high acuity was not as important then. Um, in the case of marine crocodiles, it's a little bit more different, uh, difficult because um, crocodiles use certain different, or modern crocodiles use certain different senses. So they have lots of senses, um, sort of movement senses on and around the jaws. And so those can be used to um, pick up sort of tiny vibrations in the water. And there's at least some evidence from the skull um, that uh, ancient marine crocodiles might well have been using or might well have had similar structures and been doing that same sort of thing. It's a little bit more difficult um, working on outside of the skull because you don't have any bone there to sort of constrain it. Um, I don't know offhand about uh, instances of that in plesiosaurs and the like. I know potentially some people have suggested similar structures might exist in ichthyosaurs, but it's, again, it's sort of very difficult to show because ichthyosaurs are very different to crocodiles. They don't have exactly the same sort of fine detail in the anatomy to compare directly. Now, but also uh, you mentioned, Ben, that the olfactory capacity of the ichthyosaur was all, also very well developed. And so you combine that with the visual acuity, I mean, it must have made for a near perfect predator. Yes, yes, I think they would have been um, quite formidable, certainly coming up, a, coming up against a, an eight or a 10 meter long tendodontosaurus that was out to get you, would have been quite a dire prospect. Um, and it does seem to be features like this that um, helped ichthyosaurs to survive for their full 160 million years, mm. um, right from the beginning of the, the Triassic, 250 million years through to 90 million years or so ago. Um, they had a, quite a, a wide range of diets in the early ones, particularly going from small half meter long ones right up to the massive 20 meter ones, must have had different diets and sort of formed their slightly different niches within them. So they um, diversified from that sort of thing. When it comes to the, um, when it comes to the later ones, so the Jurassic and the Cretaceous ichthyosaurs, these ones from 200 to 90 million years ago, not the very earliest ones. These are all from one single group and they are all the ones that have this, there are this famous very tuna-like body form with the crescent um, tail fin and other structures like that. Um, looking at the gross body morphology, they're not as diverse as the ichthyosaurs, the earlier ichthyosaurs. And in terms of their feeding ecology, uh, in terms of the way their, their jaws bite there, whatever, they may not be as diverse as either. But their work we've done with, um, with a master's student, Jane Reeves, um, has shown that while they may not be as diverse in terms of the shape of the body, in terms of how they were forming niches and which ecological niches they were occupying, whether small or large predators, fish eaters, generalists, were still an important part of both Jurassic and Cretaceous ecosystems. And, he, and over the last five years or so, lots of researchers have been interested in looking at the Cretaceous because this has been relatively poorly known. These are the last 50 million years of ichthyosaur evolution. And there aren't really these exceptionally preserved sites. There's lots of scraps and incomplete specimens, but no, no place where you can find very complete or lots of very complete ichthyosaurs. And so researchers have been very interested in trying to find as many specimens as, as possible, identify different and new species within them, as well as start to look at aspects of the, the skull, the, the teeth, the body size, and trying to work out um, what was happening with the, all of these different ichthyosaurs. Because one of the, the really unexpected things about ichthyosaurs is they went extinct about 30 million years or so before the extinction of the dinosaurs. Right. In a, in a, they went in, a, in an extinction period, but a comparatively minor extinction period. A few other small things went extinct, but most other marine reptiles 
went through relatively unharmed, and yet ichthyosaurs, which had survived 160 million years, all went extinct at this point. And it's um, there's several different um, sort of lines of evidence. One is that they were relatively non-diverse and so couldn't survive because they all went extinct, couldn't diversify. There's some evidence that there was climate change effects that ichthyosaurs couldn't adapt to because they potentially couldn't evolve fast enough. Uh, and there's um, at least I heard it suggested as well that some aspects of their diets, their prey, because they preyed a lot on um, belemnites, these uh, squid-like things from the uh, through the Mesozoic. Bedlamites were a hard hit at this, mm. this smaller extinction, and ichthyosaurs might well have suffered from a lack of diet. So that's why people have been interested in trying to see just how diverse were these were these last ichthyosaurs? Were they able to feed on diverse prey, or were they sort of stuck in a rut and then suffered when that rut eventually eventually ended on them? It sounds like the, the, the primary factor seems to be the food chain, because obviously in the fossil record, you might be able to see whether other marine reptiles, you know, continue to exist. Uh, you know, so if, if it was something specific to the ichthyosaurs, you would have thought it would have been uh, something like the, 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 the food chain. That was the problem rather than rather than the other factors that are being considered like being not diverse, for example. Um, yes, and I think that, so working with um, this idea of the, the food chain um, and then looking at how that is affected, not just by um, ichthyosaurs in that ecosystem, but also how the different groups are evolving with that and also how the environment is driving changes in that ecosystem as well, becomes quite important. And so it's this combination of where in the where in the food chain, in the food web, are ichthyosaurs represented? And then how are the things that ichthyosaurs feeding on affected by a change in climate, a change in sea levels or things like that? Because if, if your ichthyosaurs are all eating one thing and then that one food thing goes extinct, your you ichthyosaurs go are going yeah. to go extinct, yeah. Yeah. Can I ask another question? question? Yes, please. Um, talking about death events, um, I just want to... Um, ask you about the we're talking the strawberry bank is is um relates to the toarshan stage i think of of the early jurassic and there was an extinction event then i believe and i was wondering why there is this extraordinary um concentration of or fatalities of um breeding ichthyosaurs and their young was it um, uh, was there something happening that affected them that they would their mortality um, was so great at this one in this one place or in this area um, can, can you can you draw any is there any evidence for why strawberry bank was so rich in specimens that had deceased um, prematurely presumably um it's an interesting one and so yes you're you're very right so um, strawberry bank is from the Tuastian and then there there is this major event going on at the time it's what's called the Tuastian oceanic anoxic event. So this is, it's a globally recognized event in this case. So there's, it's not just um, Strawberry Bank that's having this one. It's um, found, records of it are found in uh, the UK, across Germany, Morocco. I think if you go around to, um, I think there's some in Japan and other places like that, where there are rocks of these ages exposed. They all find this, um, this uh, oceanic anoxic event, which is essentially the ocean's for some reason, circulation, all of the ocean currents stopped, circulation broke down. And because these there weren't currents moving nutrients around or oxygen or whatever, the oceans essentially stagnated like a, a pond that hasn't been moved and mm -hmm. it's left for too long. It starts essentially rotting from the inside. And so this was happening on a global scale at the Tuarstian for and no one quite knows what the causes are. It can be identified by, in many places, lots of what are known as black shales. And these are very organic rich um, clay-like sediments. So particularly in deep water, you get very fine grains, but lots of organic material because this wasn't being rotted at the surface like normally, but it was everything in the, in the ocean had died. And so all of the organic material just fell down to the sea floor and formed meters upon meters of this very organic rich sediment. 
And this is the oceans in which these ichthyosaurs from Strawberry Bank, from Germany and various other places were living. And having all of this organic material falling to the ocean floor is an excellent place to start preserving lots of material because you don't get all of the usual critters, crustaceans, worms and whatever on the seafloor that would usually um, come along, move around an ichthyosaur, bite it, eat it and whatever. But you don't have any of the other things that are swimming down um, to eat it, feed off the carcass either. And so these are these are sort of the perfect places to start preserving uh, large numbers of different organisms. Um, and in the case of the Tuatian marine reptiles are particularly famous from there. So that's sort of one side of the story is that the situations of the oceans at the time were particularly good for preserving, preserving lots of specimens. And so because of that, we find lots of specimens. The, the sort of second thing you were getting at were, was why we find particularly these pregnant um, ichthyosaurs or these young ichthyosaurs. And that's a little bit more difficult to answer. There's sort of two things, or well, at least two sort of um, primary things that could be going on there. One is that because we've got this situation that preserves lots of specimens, it means that we also preserve some of the much rarer occurrences. So there'll be lots of ichthyosaurs giving birth in normal times when there isn't this um, ocean anoxic event. But if you only preserve one in a million, then chances are you won't find a pregnant female. But if you then start preserving 10 in a million, 20 million, it may not be that many overall, but it's 10 times, it's 20 times more. And so you can then start to get an increased capture of these re relatively rare occurrences. So the pregnant females and things like that. There's also been at least some suggestion that where you do find lots of these together, that might indicate that these waters might have, for whatever be reason, been birthing grounds. Um, as I mentioned, both in the UK, where Strawberry Bank is, but also in places around Germany as well. There was deep water, but there are also several islands around there. And so having this combination of deep water where ichthyosaurs could live and feed, but also being fairly close to islands where um, they could potentially give birth or they're young if they did sort of grow up around islands and shallow waters could live, then it's sort of this combination which means that this other, what would otherwise be a rare event just becomes much more common. And so I think it's going to be some interplay between those two things, both the, the rocks and the oceans themselves are preserving many more specimens, so you find the rare ones, but also the localities themselves are the ones where you would find a pregnant female or a very young ichthyosaur, and so you would find more of these specimens or preferentially these specimens rather than other ones thank you okay. yeah the other the other one that uh, question that i have is to do with the fluid dynamics that you talked about uh, ben. Mm -hmm. i mean and correct me if i'm wrong here but we, you know if I've, I've got the wrong end of the stick here but it seems as if body shape didn't seem to make much difference and it's roughly the same as the modern dolphin in the, you know in terms of uh, the efficiency uh, but then in terms of body size that made a massive difference you would have you know in, intuitively you would assume that actually the body size uh you know was to smaller body sizes would just be relational you know the the, the efficiency would be the same but clearly the bigger you are the, the the better your efficiency gets is that is that because of the evolutionary nature of this in terms of the change in swimming style that is the biggest difference or is it actually the body size itself that is is critical to this in this case, it's actually um, it's actually body size itself, and it's it's an interesting story. So um, the the research we were doing with the fluid dynamics sort of spurred on by some previous work where various people had tried to work out how uh, the swimming speeds of the of various different ichthyosaurs. Yeah. So they weren't they weren't using fluid dynamics. They were essentially taking the um, the size of these ichthyosaurs, getting an estimate for the body size and then using some relationship between that and metabolism to essentially calculate how much energy does an ichthyosaur generate just going along. And so how much energy can it go into put into swimming forward? And from that, they were able to calculate a, an estimate or a range of swimming speeds. Um, and so they, those sorts of things incorporated these differences in swimming, swimming style using 
different mm -hmm. factors to sort of approximate the less efficient eel-like swimming. So that would give you lower speeds versus the more efficient tuna-like swimming, which would give you relatively higher speeds. Um, what we were looking at, trying to look at the fluid dynamics, was essentially uh, using the body shape and looking at how the forces that act to slow you down um, affect the body. And so these are what are known as drag forces. You might have come across these if you're thinking about airplanes or essentially if you, as you're riding your bike around, this is drag force is the force of the wind acting to slow you down. And so you have to pedal harder to be able to go faster. Um, and so what we, what we sort of went in thinking is that, oh, going from these lizard-like forms to um, shorter, fatter, tuna-like forms will probably lead you to reduce the, the amount of drag that you were experiencing as you, as you were going through because you're a shorter, fatter body and these um, means you're relatively less um, drag. But um, part of the, so one of the, the good things we had in there was we had a, an actual engineer. So um, Colin Palmer, who's, who does paleontological research, he mostly works with flying pterosaurs but he was trained initially as an engineer. And so was familiar with the, the actual engineering behind fluid dynamics. Yep. And so working with him, we were able to start building models and looking at validating. And it turns out that in the sixties, if you go through ancient, particularly naval, and I think the Russians have been doing quite a lot of this, they'd build actual models, put them in a real flume tank with the water and measure the forces. Mm -hmm. And so you can, they've done a whole series looking at different shapes, from really short fat ones through to really elongate ones and looking at how that affects it. And it turns out our ichthyosaurs, both from the very early ones through to the late ones, don't really change their body shape that much. They do go from somewhat longer and thinner to somewhat fatter. But in terms of how this affects the drag, it's relatively little. And so the important thing instead is that by increasing your overall body size, what you do is you have a larger body volume. So body volume increases as the cube of the length. So if you get twice as long, then your body volume will get about eight times larger. But your surface area only becomes, only increases with the square. And it's the surface area which has the relation to the drag forces because that's where the water is acting on. So as you become bigger, that means you've got more volume and the volume is where you're having the food that's generating the energy for the swimming forward. Um, but you're, um, and that's increasing much faster rate than the surface area. So you're essentially, you're having more body volume, more muscle volume to push yourself forward for a relatively smaller increase in the amount of drag forces, the amount of resistance forces you're putting in. And so that's why um, increasing your body body size has such a such a big effect because it's that relationship between body volume and surface area which is the important one as far as this cost of transport metric goes and then it's um sort of swimming star which plays the the second fiddle to that okay well that's been that's been very helpful thank you very much ben uh, jude do you have any other questions um I, I just I just wondered, you said there are about 160 species of ichthyosaur in, the, in, in that period in, when they were extant. Were some of them interim species? I, I'm sorry, this is probably a really naive question. <laughs> um, so uh, were, they tran uh, trans were they transitional between, is that what we're seeing there? Mm -hmm. So the shape evolving. It's sort of a yes and no question, and it <laughs> ends up being a little bit more philosophical than necessarily scientific in some ways. But um, so yeah, there's I think I, I haven't counted more recent, as I said, lots have been named in the last few years. But yeah, it's about 115, 120 current species of ichthyosaur are valid, and more will be named in the near future, um, no doubt. Um, as far as sort of the conception of ichthyosaur evolution goes, um, we have an idea of, um, we know the early ones that we know, so work that I've done during my PhD and since, we've got a, a decent idea of how, how they're related and we can sort of build a family tree of ichthyosaurs. In the sort of, this is done numerically using comparing the body shape and the way that's done is that you, at least conceptually, you don't necessarily know a lineage ancestor so it's not like thinking of a father to a son or father to a daughter to a grandson and so on it's sort of thinking like we've got um 
we've got a, an ichthyosaur and we've got an ichthyosaur and we can work out their cousins and then we've got a hypothetical uh, ancestor, their grandparents, their uncle, whatever, which was how we relate them. And then we go back through the family tree like that, uh, thinking in terms of sort of cousins more distantly, at least as far as vertebrate goes. So the main reason for that is because in terms of vertebrates, it's very difficult to sort of see these changes because they're not preserved that often. Um, and because you don't really get sort of a continuous sequence going right the way through. Um, they're sort of big jumps going between them. Um, in terms of sort of general evolution, there are certainly changes that you can see going throughout the whole of ichthyosaur evolution. And because we think of these sort of um, cousin, um, cousin, grand cousin, so sort of relationships, we can start to say, ah, this is the point in the family tree at which this particular feature evolves. And so you can say all of these cousins and descendant cousins and things like that share this feature. And so you can start to see that it's one feature, then another feature steadily evolving. And over 160 million years ago, that's how you change from the very early lizard-like ichthyosaurs into the, the later tuna-like ichthyosaurs. Um, there's potential for looking at a sort of a more direct father-son, father-daughter, uh, mother-son relationship in certain places like, like the Posidonia shell or Lyme Regis, for instance, where you get lots of very high resolution beds, one on top of the other. And so that means you can start off with a species at the bottom and then you can find it again and then you can find it again and again and again as you go up and you can start to see, aha, it starts off like this. And as we go up, we can steadily see this thing changes, this thing changes. And it, it's depending on exactly how much you, you end up with the same species at the bottom and the top, but there's, it's still slightly different. Mm. And in the Posidonia shell, there's potentially some instances where it might be actually this, this species is changing a bit and then we don't see it, but a different species appears and it's slightly different, but they might well just be a sort of continuation. It's um, because, because you don't get it sort of absolutely yeah. everyone, it's, it's still quite difficult to tell, but there's at least some evidence to suggest that maybe that might be the case. It becomes, uh, I, so some other work that I do is not on, not on vertebrates, but actually looking at microfossils. So very tiny things, which are less than a millimeter long usually. And because you find millions of them in every handful of sand or whatever, you can find them in absolutely every single centimeter as you go through. And in, in instances like cancer, those are one of the few instances where you can see evolution actually happening through the fossil record as one species changes into another species and how one species can, the, there's lots of them go one species and completely into another. So it stops being one and becomes another. And in some instances, there's one where it's one and then you can see where another one splits off and then another one splits off. And so they do separate, but the, they continue as well. That's so really that, clear. Thank you. That was good explanations. Good. Well, listen, Ben, we're going to draw to a conclusion, but thank you very much once again uh, for a very interesting talk. And I think it built very nicely on the talk we had from Mike Benton as well. So this, this has added uh, an extra dimension uh, to the Jurassic Arc uh, talk series. So thank you very much indeed, Ben. And right. We've got two more coming up. We've got uh, uh, Crispin Little from Leeds University giving a talk on the 7th of July on the Jurassic Arc. And then we'll finish off with our own very own uh, Matt Williams, who's going to give a talk uh, uh, on the Lagerstätte at, uh, in, in Ilminster. So I think, thank you very much for all of that. And uh, I wish you well with your research and your activities. And as I mentioned to you, the, the, the video of this will be available on our Virtual Brothers YouTube channel on, uh, in about four weeks' time, and I shall send you a link to it. So have a lovely evening. Thank See you, Jude. All the very yep. best. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.